welcome to uh, the Alumni Lounge and Behind the Braves. I love the Alumni Lounge, just a beautiful spot. Well, yeah, you were definitely one of the guys that helped us put this lounge together when we were moving into SunTrust Park. We owe this to you, and um, I just have to say, too, my whole career probably wouldn't have happened without you. I mean, you were the ones decided, you had really had no reason to, but you decided to take a non-roster, broke knee, change-up throwing old pitcher and put him on the team. So uh, get a chance to thank you again. You're welcome. It worked out all right, didn't it, Mac? It did. It worked out all right for you and for us. That's right. So that was a win-win. Yeah. That was a real win-win. Yeah. You did a great job for us. Well, we appreciate you being here today, and we'd love to talk to you about your career a little bit and then sure. talk about Cooperstown. I know that this has just had Hall of Fame weekend, and John just got back from Cooperstown again and uh, right. got to be up there with you last year. We spent a little time together with sure. Chippers, and then and then this year you got to see some some pretty unique, unique guys going in. How'd that go for you? Oh, it was it's a special place for me. It was long before I was a gleam in anyone's eye <laughs> to be considered for candidacy for that great place the Hall of Fame of Major League Baseball and here I am in it but before even that was the case I loved what it represented I loved how it presented baseball in the finest fashion possible uh, glorified the game celebrated the great players uh, and and the stars of our game and just lifted the game up to the highest level and that in that environment up there in Cooperstown it's just so beautiful as you know you've seen it and it just sets up perfectly for that celebration. And every person who goes up there, Reggie Jackson was there this year, and many of them have come back that don't always go all of the time, and, and they feel that way. They all have their Hall of Fame ring on, and they have many championship rings in their closets. I do too, but once you get that Hall of Fame ring, I have it, but it's mine broke. It, I hit it on this corner of a desk, and it's being, it's being fixed right now. <laughs> but, but anyhow, they wear that ring, and they're proud, and. I mean, it's just a remarkable place, and I can't stop talking about it. This year's class just is an epitome of what that stands for, those great players. And, and of course, Roy Holiday's uh, wife, Brandy, did a great job, an emotional job, celebrating his career as a, baseball, as a great baseball pitcher. Uh, and it was just a lot of good things that happened up there. Well, it's, it's obviously, like you said, it's a beautiful place, and we have quite a few Braves that are up there. Oh. Did everybody show up? Hank? Chipper. Hank was there. Uh, yep. Uh, Nuxie was there. Okay. Um, they, they were all there. And it was a couple of years ago. In fact, it was the year I got in in 17. Uh, Wade Boggs came up to me, and I've known Wade for a long time. And he said, hey, sure, host, we're going to have to build an extension up here if the Braves keep sending that many people to the Hall of Fame <laughs> every right. year. Let's do I it. said, I don't mind that, Boggsy. Yeah. If that happens, that's okay with me. Now, when you were in Kansas City, you guys won the championship in 85, right. world championship. Uh, um, you had some Kansas City guys up there as well. Right, so were they up there in the Hall of Fame with you? Was George Brett, was Brett, he on that team? Well, actually, George wasn't there this year. In fact, he and I communicate a lot. We're still friends. We used to play golf a lot in Kansas City. And we, he and his family uh, thought they had the date set up with the Hall of Fame, but the date was moved uh, to a week earlier, and George and his family had made plans to go to, on a big trip uh, to Europe, and they were over there, and he couldn't get back for it. So. And I said, well, I'm not going to play golf then if you're not going to be here to be my team <laughs> captain. He made a trade for me, actually. When, really? Yeah, I, my first year up there when I was being inducted, he said, I see your name on the list to play golf. And he said, I didn't know you were going to play. I said, yeah. He said, well, let me, let me see if I can't do something about that. He traded Wade Boggs, to speak of Wade Boggs, for me. And I ended up on wow. George's team, and we won it. Oh, wow, okay. Not because of me. Oh, was it? It was Jim Rice and George uh, Brett and guys okay. like that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other royal, royal guys up there? Um... You can think no, of? I, I can't recall being with any. Uh, I'm sure there might have been, but I didn't. I didn't spend One much time. One person came with to, to to mind was Saber Hagen, but I'm not sure he's. No, in the he's Hall not. In yeah. No. no. Okay. Well, very good. Well, that's uh, that's got to be great. That was an awesome time to be able to spend it with you guys. And of course, I'm sure Bobby wasn't there this year. We're still. I know he's still rehabbing yeah. and uh, hoping he makes a full recovery. And, but uh, it's glad, glad to see the other guys up there. Smoltzy, I know I talked to Smoltzy. He was on his way back in Glav. And it's probably a great time, like a little mini reunion every year. It's probably a lot of fun. It really is. And here I am, you know, I, I, I get in as an executive and, 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 and happily so. And Johnny Bench and, and Reggie Jackson and Phil Necro and all of the greats of the game act to me like I'm, I'm one of the members. I mean, it's no different. I mean, you're a Hall of Famer, you're a Hall of Famer. 
and that's a beautiful, beautiful experience to have. Yeah, it's, I've met Johnny Bench one time, and shaking that man's hand is a memorable experience. I felt like the tips of his fingers <laughs> were like like touching my you know my elbow. So, See this hand? Yeah, that Johnny Bench. Yeah, <laughs> I've been shaking Johnny Bench's hand and all those other fellows up there, those big burly guys, and that's what you get. That's what happens. That's what happens. Some big boys. Up hey, he's there. a wonderful guy. He he loves the Hall of Fame. He admires what happens up there. He's real, really a uh, supporter of, as we all are, and it's just a delightful place to be with all those great guys. That has to be a sp extra special for you when you look over and you've got that, you mentioned the extra wing, they're joking, we're gonna have to build an extra wing for all these Braves, but when you look over and there's this new crop of Braves that have entered in the last few years, and those were the core group of the teams that you assembled in, in the 90s and the early 2000s, I mean, I would think that has to be even that much more special that there's this whole group that you all went through this run together and now you get to enjoy uh, enjoy Cooperstown together every year. You know, year. it really is. Uh, and when I made the decision, back up a little bit, when I made the decision in 1990 to leave the Kansas City Royals, which was regarded as the IBM of the American League or the blue chip stock of the American League. We just did it right. We, we were the most successful expansion franchise ever in the history of baseball up until that time. There have been others that have done uh, the same as we did or more. Uh, but it's and then and then to leave and to come here and to know what the Braves had begun to do in building through scouting and player development, which is what we did in Kansas City, and which is what Bobby and Paul Snyder and Stan Kasten and everyone started doing here. And I said, this is the perfect place because this was a town that always stood out to me. It has the, the potential to be a great championship baseball town, Major League Baseball town. And uh, I was right. I came here, we made some changes. We, we made a lot of changes the first year and we started our way on our championship run and a lot of guys are in the Hall of Fame because of what they did, not only here, but in other places where they played prior. Well, you had to be pretty comfortable there. I mean, you just came off a World Series uh, championship and then why, why the challenge? I mean, did you always kind of pride yourself in that I'm looking for the next challenge? or Because you certainly didn't have to move. Not really, it was a, it was a, it was a combination of circumstances that uh, the ownership uh, in Kansas City was m magnificent. Mr. Ewing Kaufman was almost like a second father to me. He was a, a really, really remarkable man. And uh, it, we had a great relationship and it was difficult for both of us when I made the decision, when it was learned that the Braves were interested in me and they had asked for permission to talk to me. And I, I, he called me out to his office and told me that. And he said, you need to decide if you wanna, if you wanna discuss that with the Braves, uh, you have to let me know. And I, I did. and, and uh, it was a, it was a, a difficult personal one-on-one -on -one meeting that we had. Not difficult, angry, but difficult, sentimental kind of thing. And I did, and uh, I could not have imagined that things would have turned out as beautifully and as wonderful as it did, as quickly as it did when, when I got down here. So we made a lot of changes that first year to set the, the team up. We had great pitching here, and I knew that, but we needed people to catch the balls once they were hit, either on the ground or in the air. Right. And once we did that, uh, we were off and roll. Yeah. How tough was it to think about some of those, you know, as, as you made the transition to Atlanta, think about some of those young pitchers. So we had Smolty was coming in new, and you had Pete Smith, and, you know, Zane was probably a veteran at that time, right. but you had Glav. And so how hard was it to say, you know what, we're going to put those guys out there, and we're just going to let them, we're going to let them, this is going to be the foundation for this team. we got to let them play no matter how bad they do how much they're going to struggle. We just need to put them out there because you don't see that a whole lot nowadays. I mean, there's a lot of turnover. Right. Guys up, guys down, guys up, right. guys down. Instead of just saying, all right, go. And you, you, you learn it. You figure it out. But let me tell you what was the, the, uh, uh, the comfort level for me provided by uh, one gentleman named Bobby Cox. Bobby was the general manager for years prior. And then that last year, he went into the dugout to replace the manager they had, and Stan and the, and the leadership decided Bobby was gonna remain in the dugout going forward into 1991 and beyond. And, and knowing, and I had known Bobby, he and I had created a relationship with each other. He would scout sometime for the Yankees for postseason coverage, and he would come into Kansas City, and as, as fate would have it, we'd find ourselves together and talking after the game and after a maybe a, a sarsaparilla or two uh, after the game. <laughs> and we got to know each other and, and, and respect each other and, and like each other. And, and I, I knew that if I took this job, I was gonna be working uh, hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder with Bobby Cox. That made it pretty easy to, to, to wanna do. And, and we worked so well together. Uh, we we're always honest. We didn't always agree uh, uh, with uh, on player evaluation, but we found our way through it and we ended up with the best players on our team we could get. Yeah. 
It's it's interesting. It was interesting to me when Alex was hired to be the general manager here uh, after the 17 season. Uh, I went to his introductory press conference and he made so much, or he put so much emphasis on catching the ball. And we're going to be better defensively. We've got to upgrade defensively, which I remember at the time. I just, I guess, I wasn't really expecting that. And then the 18, the 2018 season happens, and we were clearly, I mean, we were better than the other teams in the division, other ways, but. Our, our ability to play defense, to me, stood out above our main competitors in the division. So I guess what I want to know is is the, that emphasis on defense, I mean, that is pitching and defense wins championships, right? That's that's the cliche thing, but it's true, right? I mean, that was, so that was your, when you came here, that was number Absolutely one true. defense? I started with the Baltimore Orioles in 1966. They beat the Dodgers four straight games in 1966 to sweep the World Series. And it was pitching, 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 and defense, defense, defense. That's how they structured their club. And of course, every once in a while, we come up with a guy like Brooks Robinson or, Hank, or Frank Robinson or somebody like that to drive in some runs for us. Uh, and that's what happened. And, and uh, that worked. I mean, and, and so I saw that. I wasn't so dumb as to turn my back on, this is really working. And when we started the Kansas City Royals expansion franchise, when I was hired there, uh, we pitch, it was pitching and defense. And it went all the way from the top of the organization to the very bottom at every team we had. And that's what we emphasized. Because if you have that, you're going to be in almost every game. If you can pitch and you can defend and you have some athleticism and every once in a while find a guy that has some little thump in the bat and drive in some runs or, you know, what would be a good hitter, George Brett-like, uh, and you can win games and win championships. And we were able to do that in Kansas City and, and it continued here in, in, uh, in Atlanta. It's funny how how I, people want to talk about the game today. And, you know, of course, we have a perspective on the game, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, whatever. But then you can look back over the last 100 years. There's not been a formula that works any better than that. And it's still proven. So you Absolutely. can still win with the pitchers that you had. And I've had that discussion. Well, you know, Maddox didn't throw very hard. And so do you think he could even compete today? You know, and I just look at him with this kind of puzzled look like, okay, there's been a formula called location and movement for the last 100 plus years. That's never going to change. No. I don't care how hard you throw. But that whole thing about pitching and defense, I mean, it's just a, tr a, a tried and true formula that just works. And, yeah. you know, and, and good pitching, I don't care what error you know Babe Ruth would have hit today just like he had hit sure. then and sure. you know if you're the best of the best in your area you're gonna you're right. gonna play and so it, those are great conversations to have and but it is interesting that when you're you've been so intimately involved in the game of baseball for so long at a very high level you've seen it you've known it you've studied players you've studied how teams work and uh, it's just we know the game's a little different today but it's also still the same and that's the beauty of it, beauty of the game, that you can still be that guy that throws the ball 88 miles an hour with sinking fastball. He can throw right. change-ups, and he can throw sliders, and he still can get people out. Get them out. That's right. Get them out. And, and, of course, the person who said that to you about Maddox didn't throw very hard, so he wouldn't be as, as good a pitcher as, as he was then. Uh, didn't know much about pitching. I mean, didn't know much <laughs> about location and movement right. and all of that. Uh, this guy was a, a, a he, he was a Rembrandt on the mound. I mean, you put him on the mound, and he was like Rembrandt is starting tonight's game. Greg that's Rembrandt right. Maddox. That's I right. mean, that's what he was. He was right. that much of an artist, and uh, and one of the finest, greatest pitchers I've ever watched. I mean, one of the greatest pitchers right. I've ever watched, and I watched quite a few of them. But there's there's a false narrative going on today about yeah. velocity that it's getting so much hype that we think that everybody throws a hundred that that's the only formula yeah. and you know and some people are buying into it but if you really look at our team you look at Dallas Keuchel and Mike Soroka our two best pitchers yeah. what do they do they yeah. throw sink they throw sinkers and they change they speeds change and they it get up. Their spot. they change it up right and so, they let the ball sink I love that and about Alex that he's he's put together a team that's not just a bunch of guys trying to throw four seamers at the top of the zone exactly yeah Soroka is a, a, a very very intelligent young man uh, uh, from Canada, and, and we've liked him all along. He had the bad shoulder for a while last year, and they, they had to rest him, and they did that appropriately. He's showing now what he can do, and Dallas Keuchel's been able to do it all of his career. And he, he, I think he'll be even far better uh, than he has been because he's getting himself back into com competitive shape now and competitive uh, command and all of that. And, and, you know, those guys will be at the top of our starting pitching, I think. Yeah, and I've been saying, Greg and I have talked about this, uh, to me, 
being a lifelong Braves fan, watching all these tremendous pitchers over the years. Soroka to me, and I'm, I would never want to, I don't like comparing, especially young guys, to the all-time greats and greats that were here before. But in the sense of, I, I like, I love watching Soroka pitch. He's the first guy I've loved watching this much pitch since the days of Smoltz, Glavin, and Maddox. To yeah. me, it's a joy watching him pitch. I love watching when he gets into a little bit of trouble and watching him, how he responds to trouble. And he's not afraid. And it's just, it, I've said it repeatedly. I work the games in the press box. I've said it repeatedly. It's just, I love watching this guy pitch. It's a joy watching a guy like that pitch who's yeah. smart and knows what he's doing. Yeah, he's, he's if you will, Maddox light only because of his inexperience and once he gets more games under his belt and more starts under his belt and more circumstances to deal with under his belt he'll be he'll be a very very good one he's a smart young man and very very steadfast in his thinking and his his knowledge and and game plan of the game Mm. one thing that was really important for and i've heard you talk about this as well as other people around at that time we had that good young talent in the early 90s when you came in in 90 right. and you, you saw the foundation, but then you started putting in veteran pieces that provided leadership. Right. Uh, Terry Pendleton, Sid Bream. Raphael you, Belliard. Raphael Belliard. We wouldn't have won the World Series in 95 if it right. wasn't for him because Blauser no. was hurt. So we had guys like that. So much with this team today, we have a good foundation of young guys, Albies, Acuna, uh, Riley, Soroka, but then we've got Marcakis, Freddie Freeman. We got those guys. Brian and McCann. Brian McCann. That last piece that you just know, Dallas yep. Keuchel, what he could do for a young yep. staff reminds me a lot about those teams that we had. Well, it's, it's not a secret. There's a blend that you can put together of veterans, and, and competitors and athletic young guys and make it work. And if you get that blend put together properly, you're, you can win, you're gonna win a lot of games and you'll be in the games you don't win, but you're gonna be in a lot of games and likely win a lot of championships, yeah. I think. How did that, just tell us one story on how that came about. Let's just use Terry Pendleton as an yeah. example. Terry, Braves Hall of Famer last year inducted, um, very much known for his leadership. Yeah. How did you uh, see him as a guy in St. Louis and say, you know what, did you say that guy, if I ever get a chance to get him, or was it like bam, 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 the circumstances came up, oh, he's perfect? What you said at first. Okay. We played against them in the World Series, the, the I, I-95 I World Series, I-95 World Series. And, and I said, if this guy is a real winner, this guy goes about it professionally, he's ready at every play, he gets big hits, and he's still live-bodied enough to do this at third base. I said, if I ever get a chance to talk to a guy like that or talk to his representatives, he'd be the guy that I'd want on this team as a linchpin cornerstone player, not because he's playing the cornerstone, because he's a cornerstone impact guy with his ability and his leadership and his, his, com- his command presence that he has. And he was that, he, he was that. And I just decided that we needed an infield, but Terry was the first guy. Rafael Belliard could always a sure-handed shortstop, and he always made the good throws, the long arm, and the ball would just beat the runner, but he, he got him out. Sid Bream was a, was a very fine defensive first baseman. So now we've, and then we had Lemke at second base. So we had a, we had a set infield. I've signed also, I signed Mike Heath. Mike didn't work out quite as well. He was with the Tigers, but I've had the same view of him behind the plate as I had of TP at third base. And I said, there's the kind of guys. And then of course, in spring training, we were trading with the, uh, the uh, Montreal Expos in West Palm Beach. And I always had my eye on, on Otis Nixon. He could cover from foul pole to foul pole, and he could jump as high as anything as he's demonstrated. And we, we made a deal for him in center field. So we all of a sudden have Pendleton at third, Belliard at short, Bream at first, Lemke at second, Heath behind the plate, and Otis Nixon, and Ronnie Gant, and David Justice, and guys like that in the wings waiting to come in and pl- get their chances too. So pretty darn good team, and their pitching got really, really good. Yeah. That's some good stuff. Very good stuff. Well, we're about roughly a week away from the the trade deadline for this year. And, of course, the rumors. I was just before we started here, I was checking my phone and all the rumors that are out there. And everybody's rumored to be trading for everybody right now. Yeah, who are we getting? uh, Everybody (laughs) and nobody. So so we're getting getting them all and we're getting nobody. I heard this morning it was somebody, uh, a reliever from Baltimore. There you go. Okay, so we're getting a reliever from Baltimore. Yeah, us and two other teams. So I can't remember his name, but uh, I'm sure Baltimore's, uh, they may win 40 games this year. I mean, they're selling off 
You never know. Yeah, I mean, they're open for business. Yeah, they're open. They're open. Yeah. But I, I, what I wanted to ask you is, is, as we now are getting to that trade deadline, and we are rumored for a lot of things, and certainly, I mean, we're one of the best, we have one of the best records in the National League, the Dodgers and the Braves do, and both, I think, by most people's, uh, in most people's opinions, probably need a little bit of bullpen help. Um, what is this time of year? What was this time of year like for you as a GM? And you were most, mostly, I would assume, in the role of a, of a buyer. Uh, so what was that like for you this time of year? It was important. It was energizing. It was sometimes crucial because depending upon the strengths that you had on the team that you were getting ready to go to battle with in playoffs, uh, potential playoff circumstances. So you had to be, all of the work and judgments have been made. And now it's a matter of just refining how we feel about them, how competitive we have to be to get that player. And I know Alex is a very, very intelligent guy, and he, he and his guys have been working on that uh, uh, for a long, long time. And not just this last week or so, but they've been going after this for a long while, sort of setting stuff up and about, okay, here's what we need, here's what we believe we're gonna need, here's who the candidates at that position are, or a right-handed, pitcher that sinks the ball, left-hander who's got a, a firepower left arm. Um, and they're doing those kind of things, and they know who they can get. Now, the matter the matter of it is, what will it cost us to get that player, and is it is it the right thing to do? If you believe that this player that you're going to acquire can get you in through the playoffs and into the chance, or up to the chance of winning a World Series, you're going to do it. You're going to do it, even at the possible loss of some very, very fine young talent. But we have a lot of young talent. We, we, it's not, if we trade one or two young guys, that's not going to be the, the cl- closet won't be bare after that. Uh, but you have to decide how important is it. It's very important to win a world championship. It substantiates your legacy and your, your commitment as an organization to doing things the right way. And your fans admire you for it and they res- and re- respond to you and support you more. Your advertisers and sponsors and people who buy spend their money from five state area, they come in to see you play because you really care and you want to win. And so it has to, it all has to fit. All of those pieces have to fit. You have to have the right young players. You have to be willing to give them away because you have the depth and you're getting the right guy to fill the hole you need in this particular case. And you might have to ask if you got the budget. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, extra money. budget's always important for any club. I mean, for any club except two or three of them, you know, just write their own checks. But How different is you, do you think it is now compared to you could just call up Ted and say, hey, Ted, what do you think? I need to, I want to go get this. And as opposed to working with a, uh, a publicly traded company that we own by it. Do you see yeah. that different, or do you think it's pretty no, similar? No, it's, it's the same, because oh, okay. what we do, even though we were owned by an individual in Ted Turner, I never talked directly to Ted. I talked to Stan Kasten, who was the president of the organization, and I told him what I was thinking, and here's the work that we've done, and here's what we believe we can get done, and this is what it will cost us in terms of players, and here's how much money we're going to add to our payroll. Those are the things you say. You have, you're ready for that. And, uh, and even with a, a corporately owned circumstance like we're in now, there still is a chain of command. I mean, when I was general manager, I told Terry, what I, as I did before with Stan Kett, I told Terry McGurk, I said, Terry, these are the things we think we can do. Here's what it's gonna cost us in terms of talent, and here's what it's, how it's gonna impact the payroll. And, and he would either say yes or no, or he would, he would talk to somebody uh, you know, at the parent company and say, you know, here, here's what we're gonna do. Anybody care about it? I mean, anybody worried about it? and we'd go forward. No one's ever said no to me. Because if you present it that way, not because it was me saying it, because you you present it in a way that, okay, this is what we believe we can do, and we are confident that if we do it, it's gonna get us to where we wanna go. Yeah. I uh, and so since the trade deadline is coming up, I was thinking back on some of your your trade deadline deals throughout the years, and there are a lot of a lot of great deals, a lot of pivotal deals, but none more to me stick out than acquiring Fred McGriff in in '93. What uh, what do you remember about you know how long was that? Did that process take? When did you first start trying to acquire him, and how how did yeah. that? What do you remember about that that whole trade? Well, I remember a number of things about it. Number one, it was easy for me to see, and anybody watching our team. We had a lot of guys, Ron Gant, David Justice, Ryan Klesko, Javi Lopez, who wanted to be the cleanup hitter because we didn't have one. We didn't have a pure cleanup hitter. And they would get into that spot in the lineup and they would have to think that you gotta, you gotta hit a little harder and swing a little bit more and drive the ball a little further. And it took them out of the game. 
And once we got Freddie, the thing that was the most impactful on that was how he set up the entire lineup. He put everybody, we were able to put everybody in their exact place in the lineup, and Freddie went comfortably into the number four spot. And of course, the first night, did two home runs in a ballpark that caught on fire. I mean, the team caught on fire, and in fact, it was you Ted Turner. You lost your suite. I lost my suite. Yeah, I lost my suite. My, my suite, there was a sterno can that got blown over that had been lit by somebody. I don't know who did it, but uh, blown over but pregame, and all of a sudden, we had the fire, and we're standing down there. I thought for sure that game wouldn't be played. I mean, the fire department's there, and the fire marshal is there. And, you know, Ted's talking to the fire marshal, and, and we, we ended up taping off that section of, of the stadium where the girders had gotten so hot they cracked and fell to the ground. We played the game and won the game, as you know. And Fred, Freddie McGriff made his mark on this team at that moment and continued to do it for the next five, six years. Hit a home run that night, if I'm Hit not mistaken. Hit two of them. I'm sorry, two, two of them, yeah. yeah I, remember, I believe it was Skip and Peter. I can't remember if it was Skip and Peter or Ernie, but ended up having to broadcast. They just roped off an area in the, <laughs> in the stands, and they broadcast that game that night from the stands, which was just, which was awesome. It's one of those things. Well, I, I got to give Ted, you know? I got to give Ted his credit, too, because standing down on the field, uh, Stan Castle was down there, and Ted was down there, and he said, he turned to us and he said, gentlemen, the stadium caught on fire tonight, and so too are the Braves going to catch on fire. And we started, we continued the game, and we caught on fire. And we made quantum leaps and caught up to the leaders and won a division and got in the playoffs. I am, um, if I could be a fly on the wall in any scenario, I'm more than anything else, I'm fascinated by professional sports, how trades go down and how that happens. Just to be just to be a fly on the wall in a, in a general manager's office during a trade like that, just it fascinates me because I'm, I'm a terrible uh, deal maker and can't bargain for <laughs> anything. So I'm fascinated by people who are, are able to do that. A deal like Fred McGriff, like where where do you start? I mean, where where does do you make scouts. an official offer in the scouts? scouts. Does, how does that? You talk to the scouts who have seen him play, and you 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 know the people in in the game that are that you have worked with before that know him and makeup and his character and all of that, which was not you know was just absolutely prime in, in his case. He's a remarkable man. And, uh, and, and and you get the judgment. This guy's still got years in him. He's still got power left. He's got a power swing. He can handle all, all kinds of pitching. He didn't get fooled much. Um, you know, he covers the plate. And, and he's, he's be a great guy to put in that number four slot. And, and once you hear that from a number of other, you know, a number of people who substantiate one and the other, um, you know, you feel comfortable about making, making the deal. Well, the timing is huge because at that time, San Diego had the fire sale going on. Right. I mean, they were unloading kind of like, you know, what we thought the Marlins did a few years yeah. ago. Marlins done, have done a few times and uh, maybe Baltimore is doing. But so you benefit from the timing of that and everybody's scrambling to see because they had some pretty good players. I mean, think about Tony Gwynn and right. think about so Fred McGriff. Yeah. And I mean, they had some, they they had some top notch players. So there's got to be always the timing that you're cognizant of budget. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so, so many things have to come to scouts have to all agree that you like it. And um, has there ever been one that you just thought, man, this is a steal? Or you thought, you thought, man, I'm close to doing this. Should I, should I not? And you didn't, and you ended up working out like, I'm glad I didn't do that. You know, Mac, I, I never looked at a deal about, I'm, you know, it was a steal because that's, that's sort of brazen and sort of egotistical. It's about getting the player you need and you think is better for your organization and your team at that moment and hoping that the other guys think the people they got, the players they get back from you, make them feel the same way. These are young guys that can get in the pipeline and be close to the major league level and do some things and help you know, broaden the, the, the talent base that we have in our organization and at the major league level. So I always preferred to make deals that both sides were very happy about, where you both walk away with a smile on your face because if, when you want to make another deal with that group, that's true. They, yeah. they'll remember how, how fairly and how appropriately and how honestly you dealt with yeah. Do you remember who we gave up for Fred? Um, a couple of minor leaguers. Okay. Yeah, a couple of minor leaguers. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't recall either. Yeah. Yeah. I remember a couple of trades. I was in one of you know, me and Paul Bird. You traded. Yeah, I know. You traded for Paul and I. Yeah. And um, uh, I remember him calling me, and I just started crying. I was like, Oh no, not New York. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what's funny is that I look back on that as a great experience because I would have never picked that for myself for my family. Yeah. But going up there is it was a still an experience that we looked at sure. was great. And then of course you signed me back, and I got to finish my career here. But it, it is a 
you know, you can look at it two ways, a place somebody doesn't want me or somebody that does want me. And you gotta, you gotta go over that, that psychological yeah. battle as a player that you know that's part of the deal. Whether somebody releases you or trades you, you know, you just gotta work through that. And I'm sure you didn't always like no. having to call Brian Jordan or myself or whatever, because you, you know, you, we're all, he, you know we're all human beings and you know how difficult it is. And, um, but that was a part of the job I thought, no, that's man, a I'm tough sure part he doesn't it. like that. That's a tough part of it. <laughs> yeah. Brian Jordan was from Baltimore, my hometown. And he was a great athlete right. there, multi-sport football, b- baseball player. And I got him over here finally uh, because he was such a competitor and had an impact on the team. And he still he did even when we traded him. But we, you know, we we had some things we had to do and had to balance out some things and try to get a little more pitching here and there. And yeah. same thing when I traded Marquise Grissom and David Justice to Cleveland. Yeah. It was about getting the money up cleared so that we could invest some money in pitchers that we needed. Yeah. What what was the I ask one? What was the final decision? Because I know this, and you can tell me if I'm, this is not right. But mm-hmm. there was a choice: either Greg Maddox or Barry Bonds. No, no, that's not what happened. That was not it. No, okay. here's what happened. Clear here's the Here's what happened. I, here's what happened. <laughs> it's a true story. Uh, I had made an agreement with Ted Simmons, who was the general manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Ted, who now works for us and is one of our major league scouts, and I admire. Always did. Smart guy went to the University of Michigan. Played, Should be in the Hall of Fame, by football. the way. You're right. He, he, he missed by one one vote is what happened. He should have gotten in a whole thing. And, and he will someday because he was worthy. But um, he and I agreed to a deal. That we, and I, I went through the whole thing. Alejandro Pino was a free agent we signed. And in order to trade Alejandro, I had to get him to sign a form that he would be willing to give, give up his rights. So And he would go in the deal to Pittsburgh. And he did. And and there were a couple of minor league players in that deal too. Uh, and and um, Ted Simmons and I had agreed on the deal. So I, it was one, I got to spring training, it was in West Palm Beach and I, at my desk and we we're gonna make the announcement that day. And I say, well, I better call Teddy just to be sure everything's coordinated. We're gonna announce it at the same time. Nobody gets, you know, blindsided. And I called him and he said, John, I can't make the deal. I said, Ted, you did make the deal. We agreed over the phone. We're going to announce it. I talked to my owner. I went through the whole thing. And he said, yeah, but when I talked to Leland, he went berserk because he wasn't aware of it until the night before. He went berserk. He went to the owner, and the owner said, came to Ted and said, Ted, our manager's jumping up and down. He's going crazy. He can't do this deal. He didn't want to trade Barry Bonds to the Braves. He said, I can't let you make that deal. So he had to tell me the deal's off. So then the money that we would have spent for Barry Bonds, we didn't have Barry Bonds. We had the agreement to get Barry Bonds, but the money that we would have spent for him, we, we called Scott Boris. In fact, uh, uh, Greg and his wife Kathy were flying from New York after having met with the Yankees. And that's usually, usually a, a done deal if they're with the Yankees. They're flying across the country. And he says, well, they're going to land in a couple hours. I'll, I'll, I'll have him call me as soon as he lands. And, and Stan and I were on the phone uh, Stan was doing most of the talking with, with Boris. I was talking to our guys who were saying, okay, how are we going to cover this thing up? What are we going to do? What do we do now? And uh, that's what happened. And, and, and once Boris told uh, Greg that Braves had shown interest, he said to Scott, he said, I really like what's going on in Atlanta. I don't want to dismiss that. I really am interested in what they're doing because he saw what we were doing. Sure. And so we got Greg Matt. Well, thank God for Ted Simmons. Yeah, it all worked out. It worked out. Well, Ted's a Ted. I, I have great admiration for him. He got caught in, you know, in a, in a, in a kind of a windmill thing, and and it, and it, and it was tough. But but it, because of that, we ended up with Greg Maddox instead of Barry Bonds. So we either had the best hitter in the game or the best pitcher in the game. I think we came out smelling like yeah, a rose. We, we would have either. We, we would have either way. I think. Yeah. Uh, well, Mr. Schultz, first of all, thank you for your time today. Last, last question for me. When you look back at your career, is there one thing that sticks out to you as being the thing that you are most proud of or the, the, just the, the biggest accomplishment for you? The ability, the ability to work with staff, scouts, player development people, um, ownership, and communicate clearly and appropriately and, and, and honestly uh, and consistently with those folks and to build, a, to, to, to build a consensus in my mind about what's the right thing to do to make this team and this organization better uh, and continue it forward for as long as we possibly can. That, I, I, I did that, I did that, I tried to do that all the time. 
uh, and when I got in the position of power and authority, I tried to do that and, and uh, keep all of the levels of constituents involved. And I, I would ask questions and expect honest answers, and I got them. Uh, and that's the, th the, the th thing I feel most proud about, having a consistent basis and style of deal making that includes all of the people and their opinions and, and honoring and, and trusting and using all of the information I get from all those people. And then I have to ultimately come up with the answer. They provide me with the data and all the in input. I have to come up with the answer for the organization. And I was able to do that. And I did it, I did it comfortably. I, I did it because these were really good people that I was talking to. Well, you've always been Braves first. You've always done it in a highly professional manner. And obviously, you've impacted my career. And I, I, honestly, I wouldn't even be here doing this podcast and wouldn't be working with the alumni. And people, they may or may not know, but we wouldn't have a Braves Alumni Association if it wasn't for you. You've always wanted it. Well, when I kind of pitched the idea, you were all on board. Yep. Uh, you and Mike Plant. So yep. um, there again, gave me my first shot as a player. You yep. allowed me to work here. Year for it's almost been 10 years now so well, so thank you again years. and and you've always been first class so well, appreciate thanks, you being man. on and, appreciate it. and it's been been uh, great working with you glad to be with you here and in, uh, in this capacity you're in we wouldn't have the alumni association that we have now if it weren't for you i'll say that for everybody to know i mean we tried many others before th this guy came on board but your dedication your interest in it your willingness to work you got it done and we're on our way we're on the ascent this organization, the alumni organization, along with the Brave, we're both on the ascent. Agreed. Agreed. All right, well, thank All you right. so much, thank Mr. Thank you. Joe. All right. Appreciate you it. You bet.